187. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's webinar. We are going to be talking about choking prevention and we will get started in a minute. We just wanted to make sure that the audio was working properly and everyone could hear the speakers and also see our screen. So um, maybe someone could let us know if, if the sound quality is good and the volume is, is okay. Excellent. Thank you, Jody. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad to hear that it's working. We've had some difficulty over the last couple webinars we have done. Okay, the time is 1.30, and we are going to get started promptly. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar on choking prevention for individuals with developmental disabilities. We are very fortunate to have three very good speakers with us today um, talking about choking prevention. Um, first, we have Scott Phillips, who is the Assistant Deputy Director in the MUI unit, and we also have Teresa Jones from the Columbus Center for Human Services, and Robin Malin um, from Echoing Hills Valley Village. I apologize. And um, so we're very excited that you could join us today. Uh, the handouts for today's power uh, presentation were emailed this morning. If you did not receive a copy and you want one emailed to you now, you can call our office at 1-614-995-3810 and they will be able to email that information to you. So I am going to uh, turn the presentation over to Scott, and we can get started with today's topic. Thank you, Connie. Hey, and thank you, everybody, for being, uh, being on the line today. I know it's a gorgeous day, and uh, really appreciate everybody taking some time out to, to uh, spend some time with us to talk about choking. It's, it's so important, and it's, it's something that, you know, I just really appreciate you guys showing interest and taking the time out to hear the information we got from some great information to be shared today. I want to start off with some thank yous. Um, Connie McLaughlin has done an absolute terrific job of helping us organize these choking um, webinars. As you guys know, this is the third in a series of four, and she has really done a terrific job of, and, and shown great leadership in pulling these together, um, having wonderful speakers, going over great information. And I want to make sure that you know I publicly thank her for the work that she does. She did a terrific job. I also want to thank some of our previous presenters, um, Anita. De Vlasi and Davy Jones and our own Dr. Wysikinski who actually have helped with a couple of the previous ones and done a terrific job of providing information. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic to be able to do this. Um, I want you guys to know that I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from the field about the webinars. And in fact, I trained, uh, we trained quite a few nurses here in Columbus earlier this week and, and got several people that came up and said they really appreciate it. You know, it's great information. They can get it during the webinar time. They can get it once we uh, save it and they can share it with other folks. So, I mean, I think it's really wonderful that we're able to touch so many people. And so I just wanted to thank everybody for their help. And of course, I want to thank Teresa and Robin for today. Thank you very much for being with us. Just a couple quick things that I wanted to share with you guys before I, I turn it over and um, more kind of some updates and just some follow-up. As you guys know, and you, those of you that have heard me speak before know that choking and falls are two of the most preventable incidents that we see in the state of Ohio that impact the folks that we support, without question. Um, are there accidents that any time? Absolutely. Are there some that could be prevented? No question. And, and that's why these kind of trainings and your guys' uh, energy uh, is, is so important in making sure that, that these kind of things happen. And as you know, we've been trying to share this information in multiple venues. This webinar has been terrific, but we've also tried multiple other venues. Many of you know we do in-person trainings all the time, and we, we always never do an MUI training without mentioning falls and choking and what we can do to try to prevent that because it's critical. We've also uh, published a health and safety alerts related to both of these. Hope you guys have seen those, shared those with everybody. I mean, it's great information. i um, trying to get information out through that venue. We have our well-informed publications that we've sent out, um, and we've also just really shared this 
you know, almost at every training that we can, uh, both online and also in person. So uh, my goal for you guys from today is to take this information and share it with everybody that you can locally where you're at. There's no question in my mind that the best thing we can do to try to prevent this kind of stuff is to share this information with everybody we can. We can't get this information out enough. So please help us as, as, you, as you go forward after this training to make sure that this information gets shared. Um, for me, there's basically three keys to preventing choking. And I, and I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. Communication, cooperation, and collaboration. And if we all do a good job of that, you know, there's no question that we're going to be successful. Uh, some of you may have seen a recent alert that we put out related to transitions. We just put it out in the last few weeks. And to me, that is a critical alert um, in conjunction with this information that we're going to talk about today. When people transition from one environment to the next, whether it's work, home, school, wherever it is, a key element that's got to get discussion is diets, text, diet textures, supervision, all those kinds of things, meal preparation, adaptive equipment. If we can do a good job of addressing all those kinds of things when, before people transition, where are we going to set ourselves way ahead of the game when it comes to, to providing services and making sure people are safe? So I think it's critical that we do that. Something else I want to talk about just briefly is, and I know we've got some great slides. We're going to get into some detail on this. But I also want you guys to know about the progress that's been made because we, we have, over the last year and a half, really hit this hard. You guys have been there with us all along because we had a bad year last year. You guys know that in Ohio uh, we lost too many people from choking episodes last year. And I'm really happy to say that this year our medical emergencies are down, our deaths related to choking are down, and, and we're going to go over some slides related to that. But I think it's important to celebrate the success just as well as we, as we get on the line here and talk about the things we've got to do to improve. I, I know, unfortunately, a lot of times when you hear from Connie or I, it's about things that are not going that great that we've got to work on to help. But I think it's also important to celebrate the success. And you guys have done a really nice job. The field has done a, a terrific job. One other thank you before I, I kind of turn things over here. I want to thank um, Ohio's direct support professionals. Those of you that know me know that I feel they're the, they're the linchpin to the system. People that take the responsibility every day of working one-to-one -one and helping people with supports um, are the key components to this health and safety system. And their knowledge of choking, their ability to let somebody know if something's not right, their ability to, to intervene quickly if there's a problem, that, that's what makes this system. So I want to give you a heartfelt thank you from myself, our unit, the department, the director. Um, the work that you do is tremendous, and we certainly respect and, and are very appreciative of the work that you do. And kind of in following up, I just want to share that uh, because we've made success and we're, when we're continuing to, to improve, I don't want us to let our guard down, though, because I can tell you what's happened over time, and you guys maybe know some examples of this. Some of the most significant, troubling cases that we see come through our office are cases where somebody is doing pretty good and they're improving. Even though they've got risks identified, they're improving. They're maybe doing a little bit better, and we kind of back off or we, or we let our guard down a little bit, and the next thing you know, something happens. And it's one of those kind of things that, you know, you don't see choking every day. You don't see someone struggling every day. But those risks are there, and if we've identified them, all the stuff we're going to talk about and all the stuff we've talked about in previous webinars are going to come into play to really help us try to prevent and protect the people that we're entrusted to support. So, so I guess in, in closing, I'll just say uh, celebrate the success. We, we have improved, but please keep your foot on the gas, and let's maintain the momentum that we've built, you know, over the last year, year and a half to keep this thing moving um, and continue to protect people and, and save lives in any way that we can. And I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and turn things over to uh, Therese to begin our presentation. Sure. All right. I would, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Scott and Connie, for inviting me to come and participate in today's webinar. Um, once again, my name is Teresa Jones. I'm the um, Risk Management Director at Columbus Center for Human Services. My job there is to investigate all the incidents for cause and contributing factors, put immediate action in place, and come up with a prevention plan. I have two investigators under me, Whitney and Jessica, and I'd like to give a shout out to them. They're watching the presentation <laughs> today. Um, we have several different uh, divisions within CCHS. We have a supported community living, an employment services, open door art studio, which is our day workshop. We have two art galleries, our Little Fish and the uh, Career and Activity Center, as well as an ICF, which is Park West. Um, we have about 70 individuals at Park West. Um, overall, I would say that we serve about 400 individuals with DD. So I started back in 1986, and I have watched every single one of these divisions evolve. So I'm, I'm pretty proud about that. 
we're so glad you could be here today. Absolutely, absolutely. And while we have the experts uh, presenting, feel free if you'd like to chime in with a question. And then, as time allows, I'll stop and and uh, ask the question of the, the presenters. Okay, looks like I'm up. Um, so we recognized by doing the pattern and trends analysis for the state that we did have a lot of choking incidents in the past couple of years. In fact, we had two years in a row where we had too many choking incidents occurring. Um, so we knew that we needed to sit down as a team and try to figure out what are we going to do about this. Um, so we knew there were two things. We needed to educate staff on choking prevention, and we also needed to brainstorm to come up with ways that we could prevent the choking with the staff. Um, so when we went to the table, the first thing we did is thought, how can we educate the staff? And of course they get orientation training when they're first hired, where they uh, meet with the speech pathologist and the occupational therapist. And they go over the diet modifications and how to prepare the food to the right texture. And they also have to actually prepare the food in orientation, because there's a lot of them who really don't know and you can tell somebody how to do something, but until they actually do it, whole different story. So we do have the hands-on training for our staff, and we also make sure that the health and safety alerts are issued to all of the staff, and they actually see these several different times throughout the year. Um, Connie, you're the one that always sends out the alerts, and we always make sure that immediately we get those out, and we review them in staff meetings. We also send memos out to the staff we actually send the health and safety alert brochure that you send out to them. So they get that, and then they also review it in their staff meetings. And then when they come back for annual training, their MUI training, I also review it with them there as well. So by the time a health and safety alert is done, they've heard about it three or four times throughout the year. OK. Um, so the next thing is the care tracker messages. We, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with care tracker, but it is a documentation program that we use at our facility. And you're able to send messages out. So we do send messages out over the care tracker on choking and aspiration safety, as well as we update the individual's um, profile pages whenever there's a change. Now, Teresa, how would that work? So if I log on to the care tracker system, would the message automatically come yes. to me? Okay. Yes. So, okay. Yes. Wonderful. It pops right up. You have to acknowledge it, and then I can go into the computer later and actually see when, what time and date that you actually did acknowledge that message. So that's really nice. Yes. Um, and it is a great means for getting a message out to all staff immediately, you know, because we, are, we do have 24-7 facilities. And so with us mainly working, you know, business hours during the, the you know, banking hours, I guess, um, we have some staff that work the overnights that don't probably get to hear as much as the day workers. So this is a way to immediately get that out there to all the staff immediately. Um, so the team also implemented staff visits to the hospital whenever the staff um, or individuals have to go to the hospital and they're admitted, we have set it up to where staff have to regularly go visit them just to make sure that the hospital staff are aware of their diet textures and their, what they're allergic to or anything like that. We even took it a step further and we have the speech pathologist actually make those visits to the hospital as well. And their job is mainly just to keep that information going, making sure that the diet texture is correct, letting them know um, any of the past assessments that were done to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're here for the individual. We feel like that's very crucial information that the hospital, you know, sometimes when you send a book with them, they may not have time to really sit down and look at that book. And sometimes in a crunch, you know how the, this field is so short-staffed, sometimes we may have to grab a DSP or somebody that really doesn't work closely with that individual that have to go to the hospital with them, and they may not really know um, all the information about them. So it's good to have the speech pathologist go to make those visits to make sure that they're aware of everything with that individual. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes. 
Um, the other key component was training staff on what a backflow was. We found out that um, you know a few years ago they did change that to where backflows were in MUI um, whenever you had to do that. So when that first started, every time somebody would tap somebody on the back, we were calling MUI reporting that as backflows. So we found out that this was occurring, and so we wanted to educate our staff on the difference between an actual backflow versus um, just patting somebody on the back and trying to encourage them to slow down and, and just to keep coughing and try to get it up. Um, so we also we teach this in CPR training, and where the instructor really focuses on the section with backflows to make sure that they understand the difference between a backflow and um, just patting somebody on the back to encourage them. And then, of course, in annual MUI training, um, we do a quick overview of the clarification of what a backflow and a pat are. So implementing these different avenues of information made us feel confident that staff were hearing about choking prevention more than just at their initial orientation training. And so that took care of the audio learners. But then we knew that now we got to look at the ones who need that visual. And what we did is we went back to the table to brainstorm on how can we reach to them. What we came up with was the first thing, after sitting down with the team, the OT and the PT and the QIDPs and myself and a lot, and the, a lot of different other um, administrative staff, um, that we had eight different diets that our individuals were being served. And we thought that was really confusing for the DSPs. That is a lot of diets to have to keep track of, especially when you have eight individuals in one apartment. And if you don't really typically work in that apartment and you get pulled to another one, okay, now you've really got a lot of dynamics working against you. So what we did is we eliminated all of the eight different diet textures down to four. And so the four that we focused on was the regular, the chopped, the ground, and the pureed. And so what we also did is our OT, Melissa Duckworth, and she's going to hate me for you know, letting everyone know who she is, but she is our Martha Stewart, and she is awesome. And she came up with these placemats, and they're color-coded, and they have vital information about each individual. Um, so when I say that they're color-coded, um, the red placemat is to indicate that there is a red, um, the red placemat is for a regular diet, or I'm sorry, a chopped diet. The yellow is the pureed texture, and the orange is the ground, and the blue is a regular. So this automatically lets staff know at a glance which diet they are on. Um, so I have up here on the slide a, a little example of what the placemat looks like. And um, so what you don't see is on the side of this placemat, we also have the individual's initials. And th these are kept in the pantry on the door so they are out of sight. And when it's meal time, they are grabbed and placed at each table so that the staff will know at a glance exactly what kind of diets, diet textures, what kind of adaptive equipment um, they all use. Um, so if you look at this, uh, you'll see in the top left-hand corner, um, there's a little tiny thing. If you go to the next slide, Connie, it may come in a little better. Okay, here is a red one, and this indicates a chopped diet. And if you, if you see in the top left-hand corner, it shows that during family-style dining, this individual is an independent server. And they use a high-low plate along with standard utensils, and it shows where to place it at the table, and then it shows also that they are on an 1800 calorie chopped diet. Um, and then of course we have cues for choking prevention, telling them to slow down, take smaller bites, chew more thoroughly. So this is an example of what a chopped diet looks like. Now what would an independent server mean? Um, that would mean that when they are passing the food, they can actually get their food out themselves, that they have that ability to do that. Okay, the yellow one. This is a pureed diet. Um, they use standard utensils, divided plate to help slow down trying to get the food. Um, this is a pureed texture. 
And as you can see, they're on honey thick liquids. And if you look, it says fed by staff. So in, this individual is actually fed by staff, and it prompts the staff to give smaller bites, alternate bite sips, maintain upright posture, um, and those were all to prevent choking. This orange one is the ground diet, and in the top left-hand corner, it shows that you physically prompt for serving. So you may have to say, um, this is your section of the food on the, on the platter, um, and then that way they can reach up and, and take their serving. So they will need, or physical prompts is when you actually have to do it, but we have some that are on verbal prompts as well. Um, this person has to be cued to slow down, to set utensils down when stuffing mouth and must have supervision when they're in the kitchen. So they must steal food and you have to watch them for that. So, And my last slide is um, shows the HOH assist with the serving. That's hand over hand and that's where the staff may have to actually help them to serve themselves from the platter. And this shows that it's irregular because it's blue. And um, also the prevention for choking is to allow ample time to eat. So what happens if there's a change in the diet? So the team meeting will or the team meeting will be held to discuss the change, and then the OT will automatically change the placemat to accommodate for the changes. And then a care tracker message will also go out to notify staff immediately. And there will also be a profile update on Care Tracker so that all staff are aware of the change as well. And then, of course, we, in the staff meetings, we also discuss the diet changes. And that's all I have. Well, before we get started with Robin, I wanted to see if the audience had any questions for Teresa. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a quick question while we see if anyone else has any. Um, how does your um, agency deal with individuals who may not want to um, eat their prescribed food texture, or how does the team kind of address that, generally speaking? I know every situation is different, but I think that's sometimes a challenge for it us. Is, it is such a challenge. Um, luckily, um, the staff are very good at redirecting them. Um, we do have some that try to steal off of each other's plates because, you know, they're sitting at the table together, dining together, and it can be a challenge for the staff. And we have staff who are placed at the table with them to help interact and try to redirect them if that happens. But for the most part, the individuals are pretty good about, you know, not getting too upset about that. Good. Yeah. Okay. We do have a couple questions. Okay. The first one is, are those placemats available to agency providers? So I think maybe your OT could have a job on the side. Now she may not be so unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you what, these placemats are awesome. I, I just love them. And I, I can leave my email address with Connie, and after the presentation, if anybody would like to email me, um, sure. I also brought the placemats with me today. Um, I wasn't sure if we would be able to, if you would actually be able to see me, but I would be glad to um, assist anybody that would like to adopt this. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and then we have another speaker who, uh, speaker, um, another audience member who would like to go over the placemat colors again and which, and which color means what. So I'm going to go backwards, okay, and start at the beginning here. I believe that was with red, right? Yes. Okay, so the red placemat indicates a chopped diet. And of course, it's also written at the bottom of it, but most of, because we did condense it down into only four diets, it's a lot easier for staff to remember, and the staff are so good at just being able to grab them and, and know exactly what color indicates what, because this has been um, into place now for a couple of years, and we've had a lot of success with it. Um, but the red indicates a chopped diet. The yellow indicates a puree diet, which on the screen it looks yellow, but it's really a um, fluorescent green. And then the orange is a ground, and then the blue is a regular. And to me, these look like just pictures that you could 
drab off line and cut out and yeah. and you have them nicely laminated so they stay nice and neat during meal times. So what a wonderful yeah. system. And they're the size of a regular placemat too. Okay. So excellent. Was there anything else you wanted to add? I oh. Um, this is Rab and I have a question for Teresa. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you had any problems with surveyors coming in with this on the table saying Good this question. is Good question and I knew that was going to come up. And I can say no. And if there's any surveyors out there who are logged in, um, we have went through several surveys and um, so far they have passed the surveys. And I think it's because we have the initials on the side and they're not left out after meal time. They're, they're put away inside the pantry door. Um, so I think that helped. It's almost like a, uh, it's like a, a tool just to make sure that something as important as a diet texture is handled appropriately and even some of the adaptive equipment and other things that are on there. And it looks very nice and it's not like it looks gaudy or out of place or anything like that. I mean, I think it's, uh, I think that's probably why you have that an issue. I like also too because you could argue that and probably it is used for the individuals that you're serving to become more independent. Hey, I know when I go to dinner I need to get my cup and it looks like this. I need to get fork, spoon, and knife. So it can always be used that way as well, which is nice. Instead of having to prompt someone to have a visual cue that they might understand. So excellent. Uh, and I think just if you were an employee who does get pulled to different spots, how nice is this as opposed to trying to find the, the service plan or trying to find hard. something else? Um, yeah, I think it makes it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense. I would I would yeah. like to say that um, I am proud of it and that I'm hoping that this is maybe why the choking, knock on wood, the choking incidents have really went down at our facility. Um, sure has a lot to do with that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, thank Teresa, you. for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing all your information. And we are going to move on to Robin. Welcome, Robin. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Good. Okay. Robin, just like Teresa, has been in the field since 1986 as well. So we're very lucky to have such an expert with us. So you want to go ahead, Robin, and tell us a little bit about what you do for your organization. That would be great. Okay. I am the Health Care Service Supervisor for Equine Lakes um, in Northern Ohio. We have, eight, we have seven group homes of eight individuals. Um, I work from um, when the individuals are um, they are into our facility um, with setting up diets with a dietitian. Um, I work with the staff in training. Um, so I have my hands in everything that has to do with health care within our organization. We do have, um, we are in five different counties, and we have um, group homes, we have waiver homes, we have Equine U is like a little um, college for individuals to go to to um, learn skills for the job market. We have community connections where um, is a day program where our individuals would um, attend. Also outside individuals may attend these also and they um, learn job skills and um, they look for jobs within the community. We have the group homes up here in Lorain County which I'm responsible for. Um, and they opened in 1991, and I started in 1991 with um, Equine Lakes opening those group homes, and I've been uh, I've been on and off a couple times due to um, children, and now I'm back to stay. Um, our other group homes um, in our other counties are larger facilities, which are in the process of downsizing and making group homes and um, purchasing waiver homes. So that's really exciting. We're going through a lot of changes here at Equine Hills Village. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. And um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what our facility um, concentrates on to um, promote health and welfare for our individuals. In our field, you know that I'm working with individuals with developmental disabilities. They are at great risk of choking. 
Um, we have been very lucky up here with our staff um, training, with monitoring um, through our meals. Our individuals and staff, they do eat their meals together. Um, it's all family style, and during this time, not only are they um, having dinner conversation with the individuals, but they're always watching to ensure the health and safety of the individuals or any notice any signs of, hmm, they're um, eating a little bit different or they're not eating at all or what's going on. So um, we find that the staff eating with the individuals at the table is um, a great monitoring system. Okay. Next slide. Um, what we do for monitoring, um, what we train our staff when they come in is, you know, to, to monitor all meals, um, to watch for eating, eating too fast, um, not chewing properly. What we found out with some of our individuals, um, oral hygiene sometimes is not the best but they can't communicate, oh my God, a toothache, I can't chew. So sometimes you notice that they're not chewing right, but they're hungry, so they do the best they can and they swallow. Um, and that um, is definitely a choking hazard. Some of the individuals that maybe have some cerebral palsy, they, um, their saliva, they have a lot of saliva. It's hard for them to chew and to swallow because they have a full mouth. Um, muscle control, especially with a lot of our individuals, um, they're getting older and we're noticing a lot of different muscle control, but that's also in the mouth and with the tongue where they can't maneuver the food in their mouth as well as they used to when they were younger and to chew and swallow. Um, side effects of medication, especially psychotropic medications. Um, we're always aware of that. We always, our nurses and our, our psychiatrists, they always do the AIMS test to make sure, and they watch, you know, their mouth, their tongue, and we pick, pick up on that quickly if diets need to be changed. Um, head position, you know, are they positioned right in their chair? Is their head up? Is, you know, do they have where their chin is up so they can swallow properly? And um, we also train with some of our individuals that need assistance with eating that, you know, the, the um, how much food you give them and how fast you give them. You have to give them more time than maybe you and I would eat um, rushing through lunch. They have to have that time to chew, to swallow, take a little bit of break, and then um, maybe offer some more food. Always communicate during um, meal time to see what food they want, um, if it's too fast, if it's too much um, on the spoon. Okay. Next slide. Um, we also train our staff because we do have individuals that um, have a history of aspiration. And sometimes it's very hard to tell. You know, they're eating fine, and then all of a sudden, you know, after their meal, maybe they start coughing. Um, it, it doesn't have to be always during the meal. So we always tell the staff, you know, you know how, how is that person eating? Have you noticed any problems? Um, so. Um, like I said, if there is an issue that, well, you know, every time I feed them, you know, these liquids, they seem to cough. Or every time I, you know, they take um, bread, they seem to have a hard time swallowing. At that time, um, the DSPs, as you said before, they are our lifeline you know, to the nurses. Then we immediately um, would notify our speech therapist. And at that time, she would do just a... Um, bedside swallow, which really isn't at the bedside, it is at the dinner table or the lunch table, and they kind of just sit there and, you know, maybe have a snack with them, and they'll watch and see how they're eating, how they're swallowing, and any coughing um, during or after the meal. Okay, next slide. Um, preventing, mo um, monitoring meal times. Um, a lot of times not following diet consistency or preparation. Um, we do use pictures, which are in our diet book, um, for the staff to follow. But as you know, sometimes my thought of uh, ground might be a little bit different than yours. Um, I love the idea of what Teresa does during orientation before they even get into the home is to have them prepare. And we are starting to do that in our orientation. So I think that will be very exciting to actually 
prepare their meal before they get into the home. We have a little bit more um, diets than um, they did, but we have, and like I said, we have pictures and um, you know, they will be monitored, um, the staff will be monitored by the nursing and to just kind of watch to make sure that their consistency is followed and that their liquids are followed. Um, you know, we use a lot of the um, thicket products and so um, liquids are very important. We want to concentrate on that that is the right consistency. We use similar things as honey. We have examples of honey. We have examples of nectar so they can actually see what it looks like. Okay. Improper um, positioning for proper digestion. Um, we always make sure that our individuals are sitting properly. If it's in a kitchen chair or if it's in their wheelchair, we make sure that they're you know, not tilted back, that they're setting up, um, that they have a good um, neckline so they can swallow properly. Um, and any special head positions, use like placemat cards right now that's under the placemat they can flip over for any special instructions of, you know, make sure that, you know, their neck is, you know, straight or whatever for that individual to ensure proper digestion. And also with our um, G-tube feedings, we always want to make sure that they're properly um, positioned also so that the food cannot come back up and they can aspirate on that, that they're setting at a good, you know, 90 degree angle so that food can be digested um, properly. Robin, you just brought up a really good point that I think sometimes we overlook, and I probably did as well when I was working in a home, um, and that's talking about the um, proper digestion, but also maybe the, the time following someone's G-tube feed, G feed or when they have had their meal. Um, do you guys have kind of a, I don't know, a, a best practice for how long someone should be sitting up before they you know, go to bed after eating, whether it's tube fed or, or if they just fed regularly? Yes, we do. We have, it's 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the individual, at least 30 minutes after eating or a G-tube feeding or even medication. They have to be up at least um, 30 minutes. Some of our individuals are a little bit longer, depending on their diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, choking. Um, we teach, um, I teach CPR first aid um, in the home. Our, in the, our staff go through it um, every two years as through, we use Red Cross. So we um, go through um, exactly what um, the Red Cross uh, is trained, that you always encourage somebody to cough. Um, if their cough should weaken and they're having difficulty breathing, then you would definitely go to the five back blows and five abdominal thrusts until the object is um, dislodged. If um, they cannot get the object dislodged in a quick manner, they are instructed to call 911 immediately and to have um, the emergency squad on the way. If um, they become unconscious, um, especially our individuals maybe in the wheelchair that sometimes it's very hard to get around them and to do the abdominal thrust, then we do, um, you know, the 30 compressions and two breaths to try to release the object. Um, if the object is released and there's no difficulty with one or two back blows, we do um, still send our individuals to the ER to get a chest x-ray. Um, and the reason for this is you know, we just want to make sure that there was no liquids or no um, food particles that went down into the lung. Um, some of our individuals are compromised respiratory-wise, and we want to make sure that, you know, they don't have a strong cough even afterwards, that there's nothing in the lungs that needs to be treated. Okay. Um, medication, the next slide. Um, medication administration, um, our meds are prepared different ways for individuals. We have them where they just take them with water and come to the med cabinet. Some are crushed, some are dissolved, some are put in pudding, and some are through the um, G-tube. We do in individual specific training on all 
our individuals and all our med passers um, so that they understand how each individual takes their meds, if it's dissolved, if it's maybe they do, maybe they can have some pleasure foods, so they take some of their medications with pudding, um, but most of the medications they take through G-tube, that would be all spelled out in their plan. Um, and it would be right in the book for the um, med passer to see. We do not allow any certified med passer to pass meds without individual specific training on our individuals. Um, the G-tube, um, we talked about before, G-tube meds, we always, um, you know, flush the meds before and after each medication um, to promote um, absorption of that medication, but so also to rinse to make sure that it is down into the stomach. Okay, so that's our medication pass. And, of course, with medication pass, we never give medications in bed. Um, and if it's um, a G-tube or somebody that has difficulty swallowing, of course, they're up um, at least 30 minutes after the medication is given. Okay. Quick action. If any time there is a change in eating habits or noted change in swallowing, um, quick action is essential for the health and welfare of the individuals. And we talk about this constantly within our homes um, that, you know, how is somebody swallowing or um, the CSPs are, are so excellent. They know the individuals so well. They know, they might not know that they're having a problem swallowing or they might not know that they have a toothache, but they know something's not right. You know, they didn't eat at all, but when they swallowed, it seemed like they were swallowing really hard or, um, you know, they were taking um, just really tiny bites and barely swallowing. Um, so that quick response to the nurse is um, excellent. And we do that through on-call if it's um, needed um, media attention, but also we use a communication book with um, important to and important for our individuals, and um, we read that before we come in on each shift, and it would be in there that um, they've noticed that somebody's really not eating or that they might be having, um, maybe they're drooling a lot, and then the nurse would sit and watch them through a meal or through a snack, and of course we would contact um, our speech therapist and our dietitian both. They work, both work very well together to get not only the consistency right, but make sure that they're still getting a nutritious diet. Robin, so I have a lot. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. um, if someone is, so I know some of the people that you serve are in the community, and um, some of the people that are on the line right now wouldn't have access you know, they unfortunately wouldn't have access directly to a speech uh, therapist or a dietitian. Um, what what would you what would your advice to them be if they're say an independent provider working with someone and they notice these changes? Um, I would um, make a doctor's appointment, and that's what we have done in some of our waiver facilities. I mean, we don't have a dietitian or a speech therapist on staff. They're consulting for us, but I know in some of our other facilities that they're waiver home. Um, what we do is we um, make doctor's appointments. They go to the doctor and um, they say, you know, this person seems to be having problems swallowing or whatever the symptoms are, and then the doctor would refer them um, for maybe a barium swallow or maybe, you know, they would check out and see what needs to be done health-wise there. So we use our primary care physician um, as a referral. Thank you. Um, silent aspiration. Um, we have had individuals that we have dealt with for many years with silent aspiration. And to me, um, that has been the scariest. You know, I can tell kind of when somebody's choking and, oh, where they're having a hard time chewing, you know, their tongue's not moving right, they're not moving the food around in their mouth. But silent aspiration is a little bit trickier because some people, they always don't show the same signs as um, somebody that just is having a difficult time swallowing or choking. And um, what we find out is somebody can be silently aspiration over a period of weeks with us not really noticing, maybe they have a little bit of cough 
you know, 30 minutes after they ate, but they don't seem to have any problems really eating during that meal time um, until we find, you know, three weeks down the line, oh my goodness, this person's really congested. They seem short of breath. Um, and, you know, we listen for lung sounds and um, take them to the doctor and end up that, you know, they have a full-blown pneumonia from um, aspirating over several weeks. So um, that is um, uh, what we have dealt with with some of our individuals for quite some time. Um, so usually um, the dietitian, the speech therapist is brought in. We're very lucky that usually our speech therapist will go in um, during the barium swallow at our local hospital because she knows that individual better than the speech therapist on the hospital staff. And she will watch and give suggestions to their speech therapist. And as a team, we work together to find out what diet is best for them. Um, you know, G-tube is, is absolutely the last, last resort for any of our individuals, but at times that um, we do have to go through, um, you know, we do have to do the G-tube feeding. Um, when our individuals do have a G-tube feeding, we try at least to um, keep them on some type of pleasure food if it's not um, a danger to their um, health and welfare. Okay. Um, what is my next? slide here. Okay. And when our, um, when our individuals do, um, if they have to have a G tube for nutrition, um, we just don't say, okay, they're on a G tube because they had aspiration pneumonia or they can't swallow. We always follow up with routine um, modified barium swallows to make sure that sometimes maybe their swallowing hasn't changed, maybe they can increase their pleasure foods. Um, like I said, G-tube um, feedings with um, only that is their only nutrition is the last, last result. Okay, I think that is all I have. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions for Robin? It looks like one has already come in. Do you have time for a quick question, Robin? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, the question is, can a guardian sign permission against a physician's order for a pureed diet? Let's say the individual has aspiration or silent aspiration or a history of aspiration pneumonia, G-tube, to allow staff in a wavered or licensed facility to serve the individual a chopped food? And if you don't feel comfortable <laughs> answering that question, we maybe have, Scott will weigh in. You know, we have ran into that um, with one of our individuals that was a, a G-tube feeding, and he was allowed to have two ounces of pleasure food parade. But when he went home, family was food. You know, that was their life. That was where, how they celebrated with food. And mom had a very, very difficult time not feeding the individual. He would come back, his um, jevity not used. You knew he ate. Um, sometimes he would come back and he would have some aspiration. And that, and what we did, as we figure, it's a team decision. We're all in it together for the best interest of that individual. Um, so we sat down and we have a team meeting with that guardian and we explain the risk to that individual, to what could happen to that individual if they did eat or if they ate a chopped diet when they the doctor ordered a parade diet. Um, you know, some of our individuals are getting very vocal and advocates for themselves, which, which is excellent, and they don't want to be on a diet that they, um, you know, the doctor has ordered. It's training, you know, it, it's, it's training, explaining what can happen using whatever technique you can use, if it's pictures or slides or, you know, even the process, what happens when they're swallowing. Maybe they need to go to the um, modified bearing swallow and see how their family member is actually swallowing and what is happening inside. So we go through all, you know, everything that we need to do to help that 
family member or that individual understand what's really going on with their system. And to tell you the truth, um, after all of that, we, um, we haven't had an issue. Robin, I have a question for you. Um, do you ever have uh, any of your individuals sign a dignity of risk? Um, not up here in um, northern Ohio, but down in our, one of our uh, Coshocton facilities, um, there was an individual, and they were on a special diet, and they wanted to eat. They wanted to eat, and um, they did sign a dignity of risk that I know if I eat this, and I don't know if it was pizza, but if I know if I eat this pizza, that I have a risk of aspirating, choking, and possible death. And then they would sign it. Um, they were having them sign it every time that they wanted something outside their normal meal. Um, we have done that before. Yes, we have. And that was the individual where they were their own guardian. Um, but it is after much, much, you know, training. We just can't, um, you know, we just don't say, oh, they want to eat that, so, you know, it's their right, and they can eat that. We make sure that they're trained and they, they understand the training and the risk of not following a um, doctor's orders. Scott, do you have anything to add? Yeah, actually, I do. I think, and I, and I agree with, uh, I agree with you, um, Robin, and I also think that, Teresa, you guys are right on track. To, to me, what, what it comes down to, and, and there's a lot of discussion going on with the field right now. You guys know that there's a lot of discussion about rights and, and expectations with rights, and then also balancing that with health and welfare. And to me, there's some really, really good conversations going on in the field right now about these very things. My, my perspective, and you guys all know me, you know, you know I work in the... MUI unit, you know, health and welfare is our life. Um, I certainly probably find myself weighing on the side of health and welfare in, in cases like that. But I think what you have to look at is it's truly the risk. If there's immediate risk for whatever is being asked to happen, and it's significantly documented immediate risk, that's different to me than, you know, we'll use the example of a, of a cigarette. There's a risk that you might get lung cancer if you smoke a cigarette. If I smoke a cigarette today, there's not a real chance that tomorrow I'm going to have lung cancer. I think that the teams are really doing a good job these days of talking about, you know, what are the, the health and welfare concerns, what are the rights that we've got to consider, and trying to balance those. Um, I think it is, you guys both described some, some uh, and you did specifically, um, Robin, talk about the examples that you guys had that I think are very good, and I think that's what has to happen with the teams. They've got to talk about what's the risk, is it an immediate risk, is it not an immediate risk, is there a dignity of, of, of risk issue? Um, and can't does a person understand, truly understand what they're doing or not doing and what that what the outcome potentially could be? We, we've gotten calls here several times about a few of these kind of cases, but fortunately, and I think the way the field works, most of the time the teams can get together and work it out. And, and that's, that's what I would definitely suggest. If it gets to the point where there is a complete blockage of what the guardian wants versus what the person wants, that's when I think you ought to maybe consider some you know, some other avenues and maybe even probate court if, if it's a real true immediate health and safety risk. But those are the exceptions rather than the rule. So. And, um, and it is. I'm a nurse by trade. So, um, of course, I have always go on the, you know, side of caution, health and welfare um, of the individuals because the worst thing is to have something happen and, some, you know, the person pass away. That would be terrible. Um, and that's why I said, you know, it, and usually with our individuals, when they say, you know, no, I want this, you know, that's my right to have that, you know, we can talk and say it is. But you know what? To ensure your health and welfare, because we definitely don't want anything to happen to you, you know, we're going to have a team meeting and we're going to discuss. So it's not like, you know, as soon as we have, we'll set up that team meeting, you know, this week, you know, um, and then we talk about it. it gives us a little bit of time to um, train and look up material for them. And usually the individuals are OK with waiting because they know we're working on it. Um, and they don't want it just immediately. Um, the person um, added some additional information on their question. And um, they clarified that the guardian wants the staff to feed the individual um, things other than their periodic diet and 
the um, doctor is adamant that that puts that person at significant risk. I know some uh, or some providers have, you know, met with the guardian and say, you know, if you choose to do that while you're at your home and feed him, you know, foods that we believe put him at risk, the doctor believes puts him at risk, um, that's one thing. But in while he's here at his home and we're, we're responsible, um, I know some providers have said, we will not allow our staff to do that because we don't want to do anything that obviously would put that person at risk. So um, I think that's one way some some places have dealt with it. But do you, does anyone else have anything to add on that, or Teresa or Scott or Robin? Well, we don't. Um, our staff are not. If if a guardian says you know to feed that person a regular diet when they have an order, they they are not permitted to make that decision on their own. Um, and, you know, with our families, um, and if they're family members or if it's APSI or whoever it is, um, you know, we're all a team. And, you know, we approach it, not one person can make a decision for that individual. It is a team. And, you know, it's, it's about that individual. It's not about you or me. It's about that individual. Okay. Interesting. You know, I was basically going to say the same thing. Um, I know in the past it was always whatever the guardian said, but with the new changes in the behavior rule as well as the guardianship rule, that's kind of changing a little bit. It's kind of shifting to where it's it's now it's what the team decides. So I think that's progress for the state. And probably for the individuals we serve yes. as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think, but I think it causes it causes some turmoil with these changes because we've gotten a lot of questions, and I think they're very good questions. Um, but I'm also very excited that the field is thinking about it because let's be honest, guys. For years, you know, there have been some rights issues that have been kind of just assumed that because you have a developmental disability, you don't have the ability to to make this decision or have this understanding. And I think people are really taking a look at some of those, and for the right reasons. Um, if we still have situations where people are at risk, the team needs to really address and we need to make sure we have good outcomes. But I, I'm so excited about where it's going. Is it going to make us think a little differently? Is it going to make us maybe work a little harder to address things? I think so, but I think that's the right thing to do. I agree. You know, before, you know, our individuals, um, you know, they had so much insurance. Um, you know, they were so safe that, um, you know, at times they didn't have any a risk of din dignity or they didn't live their lives to the fullest because something could happen. And I'm glad that people are looking in another um, direction to give people that opportunity to make mistakes. But like you said, if it's immediate, um, you know, endangerment for that individual, that's a whole another scenario. I think you said that very well. Absolutely, we agree. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Robin. I, we really appreciate you presenting today. And we're going to move on to the next part of our presentation. And we're going to, um, like Scott said, celebrate some of the successes we've had so far this year in 2015. Um, you know that through the incident tracking system, where all the MUIs are entered into the system statewide, we're able to pull data and kind of analyze that data to see um, where maybe we can make improvements and where where as a system we have um, enhanced the systems for health and safety. And as Scott said, we've really tried to focus our energy, as all of you have, on preventing not only choking deaths, but just incidents of choking that put people at risk. And we're very pleased to say that um, there's been a huge reduction this year. Um, from January to um, September of 2015, our choking um, deaths were down about 70% compared to the last year of the same time frame. So we want to thank all of you for all your efforts for just raising awareness in whatever community you're at, um, having those difficult conversations with teams, and for the uh, direct care professionals for always noticing when our, there are changes. We really think all those differences have really made an impact on this, and of course, you know, we won't be happy until there's no choking deaths in Ohio, so we need to keep at it. Um, but we appreciate all the efforts, and especially when you think about in all the situations where there's 
choking um, incidents, and the majority of those, um, I would say almost all of them, um, there is um, some action taken from the staff person or even the family where abdominal thrusts are being done or back blows. And so you can see just in the first nine months we had over 250 um, times where someone took those life-saving measures to assist someone that was struggling. And so, um, you know, you relied on your training to do that, and you did that very well. So we wanted to highlight that. Um, one of the things that we focus on when we look at this information is to see if there's any trends. And I think over the years we've noticed that um, peanut butter seems to be a big um, factor in choking-related incidents. Um, and really anything, if it's like a bread or dough consistency, and some kind of sticky substance, whether it be peanut butter, a pancake and syrup, anything that can like gum up and become a bolus and potentially cause um, some kind of choking. So we always look at those things. That's not to say that people with developmental disabilities can never have peanut butter. We don't, we are not saying that. We've had some places actually uh, contact us and say, well, we're, we're going to help by um, this choking prevention by never, ever serving peanut butter to people. And we're, we're not asking that of people. We just want people to be very cautious, um, especially around these foods that have been identified as riskier than others. Um, one thing we noticed is that really choking incidents occur in all different settings. There really is not one place more than the other, except for maybe a residential um, setting. But you'll see it happens in the day, home, uh, day programs, family homes, and you know obviously where people live because that's where they spend the majority of their time. And then you can see some other statistics. Connie, I just want to say too that um, you know the ones you know that you see on these slides, the day program and the residential, you know that's where we have a lot of opportunity to educate, provide information. I guess what I'd share because we got a lot of people on the line today. If you guys can help us in getting this message out to families because the ones that are troublesome for us are the ones that happen in family homes. Maybe somebody doesn't have a whole lot of support, um, but we want families to know that this is a big deal. We want families to know that this is an issue, and we tried to do that through our, our family advocates uh, through the department and some of our, our committees, but I know local communities, county boards, and providers have family groups. If you guys can really get this information out and share it, I think it's going to go a long way to help us because, you know, last year when we did have a rough year, over half of those um, people that passed away last year were, were in the family home. And it's important that we try to, to get that message to those folks that are kind of outside of our system. So any way that you can do that, any avenues you, you can do that, uh, please help us in, in, in making sure that information gets out there. That's excellent. And I think one thing that we didn't talk about yet was that, um, especially in individuals, maybe children living with their families, um, these could be young children. Um, and sometimes the items that are choked on are not always necessarily food. It could be, you know, we've had someone ingest a, a thumbtack, and because the child was very small, they choked on that. Um, or it could be an individual that has pica who needs special safeguards, and, you know, maybe um, they're at risk from taking things and ingesting them that could cause a choking incident. Things such as, like, gloves, um, um, those dysomats, things like that that are very thin but can um, cause a choking risk. So also be alert to those kind of things as well. Um, and like we've said, really um, these incidents occur in all different settings with people of all different ages and it's something we just have to be hyper vigilant about and we can't really let down our guard. I think sometimes when we um, we work with people and become very accustomed to their needs and wants. I think sometimes we get in a routine and maybe become lax. And I, I know I've been guilty of that too, um, where it's like, well, they never choke, so what's what's one time going to hurt if I give them this or that or, you know, the other staff do it, so I'm going to go ahead and follow suit. So whatever you can do just to continually to um, follow those identified risks and make sure we're um, providing the proper supervision and diet textures is, is really important. I think keep in mind, um, 
we haven't seen this as much recently, but those special events when people go on kind of really cool activities, go to the fairs, go to the festivals, go to different places, and we get out there and everybody's having a great time, and maybe we haven't done a, a great job preparing to make sure the food out there is of the diet texture that needs to be, and that's when we think, oh, maybe just this one time. We have had several incidents come through where that one time something's happened. So, so trying to make sure we still continue to do all those cool, wonderful things, but just do a little preparation in front to make sure people have the, the food and the texture that they need for those kind of events. I'm glad you said that because I know in our facility we have portable choppers that we can take on outings like that. So you can chop up your yes. elephant ear yes. or your... Yes. <laughs> yes. So they do make portable devices. Excellent. That's a very good point. Um, and I like this picture so much because I think he's like me and he thinks that cake is a one serving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we did have one person uh, from the audience bring up uh, a good point. She said that the person that she works with loves peanut butter, which most of us do. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's gotten to the point where she spreads it very thin and then shreds carrots over it to make a sandwich. I've never heard of that. Um, and he really likes that, that he likes the, um, the texture and he, and he doesn't mind that it's super thin and she's still can monitoring him and monitors him and everything. But, um, you know, obviously not putting those big globs of peanut butter on probably helped with the situation. Absolutely. Okay. That's what I have for lunch today. A carrot and peanut butter sandwich? No, just peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. And I think we've gone over some of this stuff before in the other webinars. But we can never really say it too much. The people that we work with are at increased risk for um, for choking because of um, maybe some other medical conditions they have, like cerebral palsy or seizure disorder. Um, they may have underdeveloped oral um, skills, and so it makes it more difficult to chew and swallow. Um, and many of them are in medications where the side effects um, may relax the muscles in their mouth, making it more difficult. Um, and I know I used to work with someone who had cerebral palsy, and just every meal was a challenge for her because of her tongue thrust and so much saliva. And um, you know, it was it was always a challenge to make her slow down and make sure that she wasn't putting too um, big of bites in her mouth because really her tongue was filling her mouth, you know, to the point where it would cause her some difficulty. So um, also limited mobility, um, making sure that um, people are not like slumped over in their chairs when when they're eating, um, that they have the, the right body positioning both um, after and during their meals is important. Um, and I think Robin went over this, but um, talked about you know really following your first aid training calling 911 if someone's airway is blocked, and then obviously taking immediate measures, um, doing the thrust and things like that. Um, one of the things that Robin mentioned, and I know has um, been discussed frequently here by our physicians at the department, is that if someone is laying in bed and, and it is assumed that they have choked, or they are in a wheelchair, or even in like a soft upholstered chair, the best thing that you can do is move them to a flat, hard surface because oftentimes the measures that you're taking are not going to be successful if they're on a bed. And our, um, our Dr. Y here has said if that person can't be moved because of their size, even putting something like a pizza sheet or a cutting board underneath the mattress so there's some, um, so it doesn't give when you do the compressions or thrusts. Um, that's something that you can try as well to, to make it more successful. And then I think both Robin and Teresa have said that when people in, in, that they work with have a choking incident, even if it's resolved at their home, they have that person sent out to be checked medically. And I think that's always sound advice. All right, we've talked about just making sure that people are aware if you're noticing changes in swallowing or eating, consulting with nursing staff, making an appointment with that person's um, family doctor, talking with a speech pathologist, seeing if tests are warranted, 
um, making sure you're documenting this too. Because I can say, well, it seems like Kelly is coughing a lot, but it would be good to know, okay, Kelly was coughing when she was drinking lemonade, and then the next time she was coughing, it was she was drinking milk. So that kind of narrows down the scope of when she's having problems. Doesn't seem to be when she's eating, but when she's drinking thin liquids. So you know those kind of things are are important to note, and will help ensure that person gets help more immediately. Okay. The next section we have are just resources that we've shared in the past, and I'll quickly go over those, and then I'm going to let um, some of our speakers have any um, parting words before we get off the line. Um, so some of the things that we've identified through our data, data analysis are just some of the common choking hazards um, that we see, and, and you can obviously see the pictures here. These are some things that you can share with the people that you work with. Probably I like all those things on that list, but you can show these people, hey, be extra careful when you're eating these. And it's a good visual reminder. Um, you know, hard vegetables or fruit, anything really that has a skin on it, uh, tomatoes, apples, those kind of things. And then I think we've already, already talked about breads and crackers. Anything that becomes dry in your mouth can um, sometimes choke, cause a choking um, risk. Um, other things like whole grapes, hard candies, uh, chunks of cheese, nuts, um, tough meats. So like my mother is never really good cooking at cooking and she <laughs> some of those meats might be a little difficult for people to, to chew. Hopefully she's not listening on the line. Um, other things like popcorn and chips, you know those kind of things. Um, some of the individuals we work with um, we've noticed in choking incidents where maybe they went to the workshop and bought like two or three bags of chips, put them in their work bag, and no one knew they had them, and then they're trying to eat them in their bedroom, and um, they start to choke, and there's no one there to assist. So, and, and sometimes people react very differently when they choke. Some people, their first reaction is to flee, and this happens with all kinds of people, um, where they just kind of run to see if they can dislodge it, um, they're embarrassed by it or whatever. So if you see someone immediately get up from a dinner table or they're at the workshop or whatever, be very careful and, and, and make sure that person doesn't need assistance. Um, I would follow them to wherever they are. Um, sometimes they may go into the hall and then um, stop breathing. So just be very careful of those kind of things. And then these terms we're not going to go over, but we thought it was important that you have some of these um, terms in your toolkit. So if um, you go to a specialist or you're talking with your speech pathologist and they use some of these terms that maybe we're not very familiar with, um, you'll know the, the common definition of these. So it just goes through the difference between choking and coughing, what NPO means, which most of us know that means nothing by by mouth, no food, no liquid or medications. So if you're um, taking someone to the physician and the doctor orders oral medications um, and they are NPO, we want you to have a conversation with that physician and say, well, I noticed you ordered this, but this person's on a G-tube feed. Um, should they really be getting their medications orally? Um, if you're not comfortable having that conversation, maybe the nurse or another advocate could do it. But it's important to have that conversation because people typically that are ordered NPO diets are going to have challenges swallowing and taking anything by mouth, even medications that are ordered, um, can be a challenge for them. We're not saying it can't be done, um, but we're saying it sh there should be some conversation about it and some documentation. Um, so again, these are the, the rest of the terms that we've outlined. Um, Another thing that we um, another thing that we um, wanted to talk about was the different diet textures, and we know that we know that um, across the state there are multiple different diet textures being used, and sometimes different definitions of each. 
So we just had, generally speaking, um, the different diet textures, um, some common terms and definitions for each. And then the basics of swallowing, and some of our other resources are here for you. Um, the final slides include a placemat um, that kind of go over the different textures. And also, um, I like these placemats. These are from New York State um, Office of People with Developmental Disabilities. And this is just a tool that they use um, to show people that are being trained what each of the different diet textures are. On this website, which is listed at the end of the presentation, they also have videos that show you how to make each of the different diets um, and can be really helpful. So um, just some more resources for you to have. Um, this information is also found in our health and safety toolkit. So now that we've gone through all the resources and the references, I wanted to um, give Teresa or Scott an opportunity to um, give us any final words before we sign off and to see if there's anyone that has any additional questions. Um, once again, I would like to thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar today. It was fun. I hope you guys had fun as well. And if anyone has any questions or would like to reach out to me, you can email Connie and she can get a hold of me and we'll connect. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And I'd just like to thank everybody again for taking time out of their day. I mean, it's, uh, again, you know, it's such a worthwhile cause. We've been making some headway. I want to keep the momentum. I want us to continue to, to do better and better. As Connie mentioned when she was going over some of the slides, how, how nice would it be to go through a year and, and not have a choking death? And I know accidents happen. And I know that the people we support are, are at risk. But, you know, when we see those cases coming through and we think there, there might have been something else that could have been done differently or we might have prepared better or we might have done something, um, all this work and all this stuff that we do will make a difference in the lives of the people we support. So thank you for all you do. Thanks for being a part of our uh, training session today. We'll continue to try to do these kind of things and get this information out to you um, and just appreciate all the work that you do each and every day. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And um, just in closing, we had a person ask if um, this information could be emailed to them. And um, certainly you have my email there if there's additional information you would like. Feel free to share these PowerPoint presentations with the families you work with, with uh, your staff. Um, they're a resource for all of us so we can all uh, work towards um, choking prevention. So uh, feel free to get any of this information off the website at our Health and Safety Toolkit or um, email our office and we will get that information to you. So thank you and have a great afternoon. That Thank you very much. It was an honor to be a presenter. Thank you, Robin. We really appreciated having you. Thank you, Robin.